the College of Complexes, and welcome all of you. Uh, you are the students of the professors that we have of uh, Li Ping uh, Yuan, who will be uh, prophesying uh, on from the success of modern democracy to see our future. Right, without any further ado, we will hear from Li Ping. Thank you for coming, uh, and uh, I would really like to have a, a dialogue uh, uh, to show my idea and uh, then have you criticize that. And uh, so, uh, because I I had this idea for quite a while, but uh, I tried to Google uh, the internet and uh, look at the Wikipedia. Uh, I don't see any uh, academic like uh, theory or uh, answer or something similar to, to this idea. So, of course, I'm not uh, a, a professional politician or uh, professor in that area. So, I'm, there are lots of things I, I don't know. Uh, but uh, I think this group is uh, quite knowledgeable. Uh, there are all kinds of people. And uh, uh, so, um, uh, this is probably the first time I'm formally presenting this idea. Are these Xerox copies to be handed out? From, is this from your talk tonight? Uh, yeah, except the first one. The first one yeah, is the, this one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's yeah uh, I have 15 copies I made. And, uh, if uh, anybody wants it, just bring it up here on the table. Uh, sure, yeah. Or they could, they could get them if you, if they email you directly after the presentation. They can get a copy too, correct? Yeah, yeah. I can uh, email you the, the PowerPoint copy. Yeah, that's no problem. So uh, I would like to ask you just a couple basic questions. Uh, uh, how many of you uh, would like the world to be peaceful, no war, and uh, anybody like that? Uh, raise your hand. No, okay. no, I think so, but you know, I would you rather no. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, I think uh, then the second question is uh, really, uh, uh, do you believe long-lasting world peace is possible. How many people believe that? Okay, uh, much less, but uh, some are uh, believers. That's very encouraging because uh, if you look at the history, history books tell us war, since we have history until now, we still have war. And uh, how how can you believe that uh, in the future sometime the, the war uh, won't happen again? Uh, that's a, a major a major change. But uh, anyway, I'll show this uh, this uh, presentation and uh, uh, to see whether uh, you can see whether it makes sense or not. The title is from the success of modern democracy to see our future. The democracy I'm talking about is just a, a general term, maybe fifth grade term. It's n I, I know there are people say, oh, the democracy versus a republic or or liberal democracy, and uh, I see that all those are democracy, and uh, as long as people can vote and make a difference. The democracy idea, the, the concept has been documented uh, like 24, some, uh, 100 years ago. Uh, in Greece, uh, they practice that and uh, uh, it's well documented. And uh, it's uh, been the same similar idea has been practiced around the world if you look up the Wikipedia. 
uh, during this time, a small democratic system pop up here and there, and then goes away, disappeared. They never be truly successful, or successful and uh, sustainable. Okay, this is the uh, short view. But about 250 years ago, uh, this country started. Uh, this is a, not a small country, it's a big country. Started the democratic system and uh, sustained until now. Uh, it's never happened before. And uh, furthermore, there's more and more country becomes democratic since then. So, uh, why democratic system wasn't successful or sustainable in the ancient time, but now it's a successful and sustainable uh, in recent days, like recent uh, 150 years ago, uh, 150 years. And uh, the whole world is moving to democracy. Even some people, some country are not quite at a high level of democracy. They still call them a republic or democracy or uh, have vote uh, elections. Uh, even uh, people may not exercise uh, all the rights they they have, they should have. But uh, the world is moving to this direction. There's uh, no doubt about that. And uh, this is a graph from Wikipedia. Uh, from uh, 1900 to 2003, uh, we have uh, more and more countries. At the beginning, it's uh, not uh, uh, increased, not very fast, but uh, in the 20th century, it increased uh, dramatically. The number of uh, nations scoring eight or higher, that means uh, at a higher degree of de democracy, not just uh, have votes, uh, elections, but uh, uh, during the elections there are competitors, not just one candidate, and uh, the information can be, uh, uh, the candidate can speak uh, freely instead of a limited speech. So, the number of countries reached 60 in 2003. And uh, actually, the country has elections. There's uh, 120 out of uh, 190 countries around the world. It's uh, uh, a very high number. And I think it's, uh, the trend is there, and uh, it will be even more. So the question I imposed here is, uh, what's the fundamental driver for this democracy, the success of democracy in recent times? What's changed at about 300 years ago, around that time? Our society has changed, or something changed, and suddenly democracy becomes successful. My answer is uh, communication. Okay, if you read the, the, the introduction of this talk, it's, you know, communication is my topic. If you just think about, in order for people to vote, the voter needs to know what are the issues, what ha what's going on in this country or in this society, and the, the, the voter needs to know the candidates because uh, every candidates are different and uh, they, they would like to know uh, detail about uh, all the candidates. And uh, the candidates uh, needs to disseminate uh, their, uh, their views, their opinion on various uh, issues. So the voter can make a decision who to vote or if there's a referendum, what are the topic of referendum and uh, how, how it was phrased and uh, lots of discussion. So before the voting happens, there are lots, lots, lots of communication 
required if the voter doesn't have those information they they don't want to vote they say the let the king decide because the king knows everything let the let the people higher up decide because they know everything the general public uh, doesn't know they doesn't have the information and uh, so the Think about uh, at ancient time the communication as well as democracy at large scale. For example, uh, thousands or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands. How can you communicate between large groups? If a small group like today, here we are, we can have a pretty good uh, communication uh, between all of us. So at large scale, it's very difficult. At smaller scale, the democracy did happen, as I earlier talked to Bob, and uh, he pointed out uh, the democracy was there uh, here and there at smaller scale in one city or small town or village, but it's not sustainable because there are large country nearby and uh, swallow them. They, they, they just not big, strong, have enough resources to defend themselves. So the, the democracy is not, the idea is there, the, the, the process is there, but the communication technology wasn't there. So it cannot be made uh, large scale. So what are the changes? The most important change, I think, is newspaper. The newspaper really brings the information people need to the hands of the people. The newspaper was, uh, the first newspaper was published uh, 1605 in Germany and uh, of course at that time everything is slow so take took about uh, almost a hundred years then in America in Boston had the first newspaper in this country in this uh, continent and uh, then there's an, another uh, 80 years then Newspaper probably becomes uh, popular enough in this country and uh, this country all the citizens, all the people knows what are the issues around themselves and uh, at the first uh, democratic country. And then radios was uh, the broadcast system started in 1909. TV in 1930, and the internet that started in 1970s, but most of people didn't feel that uh, until later. And then Google, of course, you can search all the information now with Google search in 1997. And uh, Wikipedia is organized, reviewed information for everybody to, to grab in, started in uh, 2001. So all this information available so people can communicate with people and uh, show their ideas and uh, uh, organize between themselves. So I think uh, this curve is really related all the technology change and the speed of accelerate a lot, uh, quite a bit. And uh, for the future, we don't see any slowdown or stop just because communication technologies, you can feel it's explosion, exploding right now all the handset and cell phones and the computer, internet, you just got the, the communication tools have no limit. So 
let's go back to compare these two different time. I call the one is uh, after the newspaper is available. I call this communication era. People can do mass communication. Before that, I call the pre-communication era. In the ancient time, in the pre-communication era, a single top-down hierarchical organization or government can be formed because that's the the only organization requires minimal communication at large scale. Okay. That's important because uh, the communication resources in pre-communication era is very, very limited. The best you can handwrite some notes on paper, but it's hard to duplicate them to give to many people. So communication is very, very limited in the ancient time. And uh, a single top-down hierarchical organization is uh, best suited in those environments. And it doesn't have multiple systems for like today's check and balance. No, that's, that costs too much. That's just there's no enough resources for multiple systems to do uh, check and balance. And the most important is no bottom-up communication. Only top-down. Top-down is easy. Only one person at the top, and then you pass the same information down, and everybody follows. That's it. If you want to pass information bottom-up, there are thousands of uh, people at the bottom, and uh, even a few percentage of them have wants to speak and then the people on the top there's no way to, to, to listen and no, no way to pass that information to the top. So this is a technically requirement for the ancient system. The bottom top bottom to top communication is is uh, prohibited or is extremely limited. But how do people feel? People may feel this is unjustified. It's, uh, people may not happy about that. But human beings have culture. Every culture has its own, uh, developed its own culture. Whatever works the best and the, it stays. So the cultural part is uh, loyalty. When you got a message from the top, and uh, if you are a loyal person, you just fully trust that message and uh, obey the my message and then no question asked. You are not questioning any order from the top if you are a loyalty person. If you are a loyalty person, you are rewarded by higher honor, being glorified in the society, and uh, so this loyalty becomes a very good behavior, and it's a necessary behavior in the ancient time. Uh, especially, I'm, my background is uh, from China. I was born in Taiwan, and uh, we learned Confucius uh, in the school, and uh, we were taught Loyalty is the central part of the Confucianism. And uh, all the dynasty after that promote Confucianism so that all the dynasty becomes stable, or the king is the top, and everybody should be loyal to the king. No question asked. That means no button of communication. That's how how the ancient time can can uh, works. That's how a big country can be formed. 
can be viewed in the ancient time because <coughs> limited communication. And the big country, of course, can take over small country. And uh, at that time, war is the, the approach. So only the country exercise monarchies with loyalties can survive at that time. And uh, of course, then the king becomes the king center of the communication. It's very important. It's the most important piece of the whole country. Just like playing a chess game. Other pieces got killed, that's fine. But king got killed, you lose the game. The only purpose is to capture the king. So in the ancient time, it's a chess game. No matter it's Western chess or Chinese chess, work the same. King is the only pieces matters. Pieces, yeah. Then of course, at that time, any internal issues, internal conflict or issues, Will be, can be solved uh, by the hierarchical system, by the ranking officers or the king. And uh, any external conflicts between countries or between kings will be solved by war. Because it's not a good communication tool. People are far away and they only think from their, their side and uh, the only thing can, can solve the problem quickly, definitely it's a war. Have a war and uh, after the war who is winner, who is loser, it's very clear. Just like uh, play a chess game. And uh, the loser in the war has no lost the center of com communication. Usually uh, the king was captured or the king was died, then the whole structure collapses. So in war is a very effective tool at that time to solve any conflict. You just capture the, the, the opponent's king and uh, then the rest of the system, the loser, their system collapses or they just have to be part of the winner system and uh, obey and be loyal to the winner. Otherwise, this, the, the system, society just doesn't function well. So everything is determined by the war eventually. And uh, of course, at that time, genocide and mass killing happens from time to time. It's not good, but it's the normal life at that time. And the, the winner got everything. Got all the people, can be slaves, or some can be killed, and uh, got the land, get, got the resources. The winner got all, just like a chess game. And the war has no rules. There's no rules, just killing whoever can last to the end or the, until the king, one of the king got killed or then the uh, war's end. There's no other rules. And uh, of course, the military was important at that time. Okay, on the other hand, if you look at the communication era, that's how true we had the newspaper and the radios, TVs, and uh, our life becomes uh, happier, or well, not necessarily happier, but uh, more uh, modernized. Uh, the general public can get the information of what's going on in the society. So the general public knows the issues and the conflicts, and the, the general public 
is capable to get involved to make decisions to voice their concern and to discuss with other people <coughs> in the communication era. And uh, one important thing is that the bottom up and the lateral communication de is developed in addition to the top-down communication. So you have the capability from bottom up. People can organize from bottom up, can exchange ideas to all and uh, to organize and uh, to take actions from the bottom up. They, they don't have to be part of the hierarchical uh, system anymore. I think that's how colony disappeared, became independent country. And uh, the colonies, they don't have strong weapons. They don't have advanced weapons. They don't have a uh, strong military force, but they can be independent. And uh, because they can form a force from bottom up. And the monarchies faded away or lost power, like the British, the king really don't have much power. And uh, other monarchies faded away. I think the only few monarchies like uh, Saudi Arabia is still there. But, uh, uh, I don't think they will be very long, or uh, they won't keep their uh, power very long. And the democracy developed. So another common character, other properties of the communication era is in a war or in some events, the leader maybe got killed but people can quickly organize and have another leader in the system. That's the modern communication era. The leader is not so critical like before. And the war becomes less clear cut like a chess game. It becomes a game a goal or a cello. I don't know whether you have uh, played or no goal or a cello. It just uh, at the end you count the number of pieces you have versus the opponent and uh, who has more pieces who is the winner. So the winner doesn't have everything. The loser didn't lose everything. Just relatively the winner has more pieces, more land, versus the loser has less. So it's not a total uh, the winner takes all game nowadays. And the something people's concept change. Nowadays, mass killing, nuclear weapons, ma uh, weapon of mass Destruction are bad. Those are bad weapons. This was not happened in the ancient time, in the pre-communication era. Pre-communication era, the, pow the more powerful the weapon, the good the weapon. But now it's, uh, it's too powerful. Kill too many people, and those are bad weapons. That's uh, some fundamental change in the people, in people's mind. And the uh, war has rules, okay? Geneva Convention, war has rules. This has never happened before. War did not have rules before in the, in the pre-communication era. So, I think the communication make people see all the crude things happen during the war. 
and the people really realize war, some war is worse than the other, so people has a feeling about what's a, a, a good war, what's a bad war, and uh, so the war is a little bit different nowadays. Less killing, and uh, when you kill, you only try. Supposedly, you kill the militants, not the civilians. But in the ancient time, they don't distinguish that. You kill just uh, as long as you are the other side of the country and got killed. And uh, basically, war becomes useless to control people. In the past, war is easy. The winner controls people. All the losers obey and are loyal to the winner. Nowadays, war is useless to come to change people's loyalty. They like you, that's good. They don't like you, you try to use military force on them, unless you kill them all. Otherwise, they don't like you, they, they don't like you. You put the gun, point at them, they may do what you said, but when you turn around and uh, they do what they like, they probably find another way to kill you. So the war is becomes useless try to manipulate to control people. In fact, war probably cause more opposite effect, get people more angry at you because you point the gun at them. And uh, the result is war becomes mostly useless to solve conflicts. Because conflict, you use uh, military force or war, try to solve that, but that may get an agreement, a signature of the leader of the other, the loser, but the people of the losers, they don't agree that. They don't, they don't uh, feel that's right. So, no. The conflict is, will be still there. The conflict can only be solved by communication, mutual communication, understanding between the people because in the communication era, the real power, the fundamental power are from people. The people will make the, the major fundamental decision, although maybe not a, a quick decision, but the fundamental force is in the people's hands. So the, only, the conflict can only be solved by mutual understanding between the general public with golden rule. I don't know whether you're familiar with golden rule. It's a uh, if you don't want other people to do something to you, then you don't do the same thing to other people. Or uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> that's uh, yeah. That's a, a basic simple rules. So, uh, and then from there, you can develop any laws and uh, international law or society law and uh, uh, to, to, to organize people. So if we can solve conflict by non-military way, then we have world peace. It's that simple. The hard part is to get people to understand this, this concept. War is useless nowadays. If war is useless, then people won't start a war because 
even some one crazy people wants to start a war. No, the war is, should be uh, by a group of people, unless all that group of people are all went crazy, and uh, then the war should not happen, and uh, the world peace is there. If we can have most of people understand war is useless to solve conflict <coughs> nowadays. Not only internationally war can be eliminated, but society can be also peaceful. Like uh, in Chicago, South Chicago, the gang violence can be reduced by understanding that the violence, the force, cannot win people's hearts. Only persuasion, communication, understanding can win people's hearts, can win people uh, support. So if you are a gang member, you think, I need to use guns to make something happen, that means you are not a good leader or you are not a you you expecting you are lose otherwise. You are not you you don't even convince yourself uh, that you are uh, correct. If you are correct then you can you should be able to persuade other people. That's how the life should be. So let's say what the approach we want to use to approach this world peace after we understand the war is useless. Here I just gave some ideas. There are some other approaches and this I it's not a, a, a complete list. So basically, we need more communication. For any conflict, we com communicate between people and uh, soften the com uh, conflict and uh, find a solution. Okay, both can agree, or most of the people can agree. And the uh, second is the idea that. Now is a communication era. People can communicate with anybody else. And uh, in this kind of society, communication era, war or violence is useless. Let people understand this. And uh, this is an important step not say we had war for thousands of years and the war has been used before and now it's time to use it again. You will be the loser. And uh, you may ask, how about uh, say Israel and Palestine and uh, one has very good weapon and they control the, the West Bank and uh, Gaza Strip, and uh, so what the Palestinian can do, they they don't use violence uh, to to revenge because they, their people got killed, and the the only thing they they try to release their revenge and angry is to say do some terrorist uh, actions. For them, Israel bombing or tank or killing Palestinian is, is uh, another form of terrorism. And uh, for, for disadvantaged people group like Palestinian, what can they do? Right now, I would suggest take the communication approach with all the internet, video, voice recorder, write your stories, publish to the world, 
and published to the Israel people to let the world know what kind of situation you are in and uh, then to generate the, the force behind the, uh, your voice. So I would say for disadvantaged group, use communication as a tool to voice what your distraction. This is actually the same for advantage group like U.S. and uh, Israel or some other country with uh, a strong military. Also have to understand military is not the, the way to control people. And uh, the more military you use, the people will try to use violence against you because you are not believe in peace and the other people will not believe in peace. And the communication, communication and more communication, that's the fundamental and bottom line. The specific action can, can be different, but the bottom line is more communication will, gener will create a peaceful world. You may ask, uh, wow, nowadays uh, there are so much communication tools uh, on, the, on the computer I can <coughs> talk to almost anybody uh, with Google Translation. I can read uh, any web page in different languages. I can translate into other language which I can understand and uh, then there's no communication barriers. But there are some cultural barriers still there. The cultural barriers are mostly left over from pre-communication era. Those are the good behaviors at pre-communication era and uh, at this time those are decreases in importance but still there. Okay. A couple examples I'll give you right now. One is uh, loyalty. <coughs> Almost everybody thinks loyalty is usually a good behavior. In many cultures, Western culture, Eastern culture, any culture, you have a loyalty component there. It's usually it's a good behavior. Everybody thinks you are a loyal person, you are honest person, you are uh, stick to your principles and uh, but think closer again the loyalty, if you're loyal to one person in the past loyal to your team or nowadays loyal to employer loyal to the president <laughs> maybe not the employer uh, loyal to the president or loyal to the the person you elected is that a good thing? Uh, I think what we need to do is uh, first of all we want to know loyalty is not always what you're supposed to do. Okay. Loyalty is a, a kind of trust, and uh, even more than a trust, it's a fully trust without questioning, and uh, with fully support without think. You don't have to think. Actually, the more think you, you do, the less loyalty you are. <laughs> and uh, you have to understand the, what the loyalty means. And uh, what we do, should do is, we respect the country. We respect our employer. We respect the person we elected, but with communication, with two-way communication is possible nowadays. We should ask for the information, what the 
elected officers to we need information about the, the current issues and uh, if we don't agree we voice that if we can get enough people to voice the, the opposite voice then the elected officer probably will bend down and uh, agree with us another is patriotism patriotism is just like loyalty it's it's a good behavior worldwide okay. i was uh, i got the military training in taiwan and uh, i know being a soldier loyalty patriotism is the number one okay it's a it's a great honor it's a great glory and uh, you go to the war you're supposed to sacrifice for the country you're supposed to die for your country you're not you're not supposed to be captured uh, by your enemies so like uh, 30 40 years ago in the military they still treat those uh, uh, war prisoners very bad because they got captured and uh, like uh, the, I remember a U-2 pilot got captured by Russia and uh, he was not allowed to return to U.S. for quite a while and it happens in Taiwan. In Taiwan there are many U-2 pilot got captured in mainland China and they were not allowed to back to return to Taiwan because you are not supposed to be captured. You can kill yourself and we will have put you in the in the in the temple. We will honor you, your families, but you are not supposed to be captured. But those kind of mentality has gradually changed. Nowadays if you are captured you try to be, stay alive, try to come back. So the patriotism is also changed. And uh, again, it's uh, what we should do is you should love your country. You love your country with communications. What the country should do, what's the best interest of the country. Okay, I'll a few things uh, here. One is uh, the property of loyalty and the patriotism is without choice. You have one target supposed to to do. That's not right. Nowadays, everything should have a choice, and the people should be able to think. Another is limited communication, which. Uh, Many countries try to avoid, like men in China, still have uh, information control. That's also a bottleneck for the uh, democracy. So in some way, communication technology enables people to organize a better society, a long-lasting, sustainable, better society through all kinds of communication. This new bottom-up force, the power, makes the military useless, makes the war useless. The communication is the only way to solve conflict permanently and fairly. So the, in my opinion, long-lasting world peace is in sight. How can we speed up the realization of world peace? It's not easy because lots of people still don't believe this. The only way not to beat them up is only through communication to persuade them. So I just wonder, could you raise your hand? Do you see the world peace? at the end of the tunnel? Yeah. No? Okay, a long tunnel, but still there. Okay. Think about, and uh, I would really like to uh, have your feedback. 
question. Yes, Gene? Uh, I understand that the United States has 11 aircraft carriers, and no other country has more than one or two. Can you explain to me why uh, my tax money is going for all these aircraft carriers? Is this a good expenditure of my tax money? Uh, I think the world is uh, changing. Uh, it's changing gradually, but uh, I think this money was not very well spent unless U.S. wants to be a dominant power around the world, yes. which is uh, quite uh, can be criticized. Even you try to be dominant power, but people don't like you. Uh, so I think uh, that doesn't help the terrorism at all. Thank you. Are you on? You seem to be a very kind and rational man. And it seems like you are projecting your own rational thinking onto other people. Do you really believe that people as individuals, and especially regimes as politicians, as authoritarian structures, really uh, act rationally in terms of, you use the word useless or use, that um, we always do what's in our best interest. That's the question, one question. Um, another is, uh, do you really think that wars are declared just for uh, conflict solving, or do you not think that they serve other interests, rational and irrational, and the conflict is created to justify those, the uh, satisfaction of those interests? Okay. Uh, two questions. <laughs> Let me uh, answer the second first. I think uh, war, of course, it happens uh, rational or irrational because some of most of the wars are uh, initiated by the leader. I think the Iraq war is a good example. When uh, Bush uh, started that, uh, the whole country are uh, mostly uh, negative to the to the war, to the invasion. But uh, once he started, then uh, everybody behind him and. Uh, it's a, a loyalty and a, a patriotism uh, factor. It's functioning. So I think uh, the people needs to understand what's the fundamental of democracy, and uh, the government should not make those uh, decisions. And uh, the people need to know more, especially war, and the people should not blindly follow the leader and, uh, for, for the war. Uh, unless the country is being attacked, being invaded, then I would agree just, just uh, against the, the, the attacker and the uh, without thinking too much. So military is the only use, I, I think, right now is uh, pure defense. If there's a visible, identifiable enemy come to our land, then we should use uh, force. Uh, the first question was? You, the first one was about human nature, whether you okay. deny any self-destructive yeah, yeah, and yeah. aggressive oh, yeah. um, right. nature. Uh, you know, the public. democracy country, one of the major characters is, uh, has to be open, has to be transparent. When a person, a leader or not, can speak openly 
try to get everybody's support, sure. no matter he speak to, from his heart or from uh, uh, he has some other ideas. But the open speech, open record comes. Okay. If he tried to do something else and being found that he tried to do something else, then the, the society will try to get rid of them. Right, uh, Conrad? Well, one form of communication is uh, propaganda. And propaganda is dominated by money and power, which is a top-down dissemination, particularly in the recent Supreme Court uh, rulings. How do we uh, assure any kind of balance in the information that reaches the, the people? Yeah, one thing is that people has to make some good judgment to see this propaganda is from big cooperation or they, they should, people should be able to think logically. If you cannot think logically, then you try to view both sides of the opinion and then make a decision. Not because this view has more dominance and then must be good. And uh, I think that's one thing. Another thing is uh, if you see some organized propagandas, they just point that out. When people realize that's just poor propaganda, then people will automatically try to reject that. Uh, Bernie Kahane and then Mark. Yes, uh, do you feel communication with uh, <laughs> staff around <coughs> from uh, going nuclear and going ballistic in Israel? Probably not. Unless they can understand building a military uh, nuclear weapon is useless. I think at this time they, they won't uh, understand that because they see Israel has nuclear power and uh, why shouldn't they have? It's just like uh, in this country, uh, gun is uh, allowed. Back in Taiwan, when I came from, gun is not allowed for the general public. But in this country, uh, it's allowed to have a gun, and they, you are allowed, everybody is allowed. So, for, for Iran, they think they, sh they are allowed to have one. Although, the use of that uh, will really create big problem. I think uh, uh, in this count, this, uh, this, this specific topic, I would tend to agree Paul Rumpel, uh, yeah, the, yeah the, the opinion is that uh, let them develop, if they dare to use one nuclear weapon, their country will get 10, 20, multiple times of a nuclear disaster over there. And uh, then they eventually, if enough communication is there, they will learn use of those kind of weapons. The, uh, the trouble they got will much higher than the benefit they can get, unless like, uh, if their country got attacked by Israel, they just try to revenge. That's uh, another story. But whoever used the uh, nuclear weapon first, they will get penalized. Uh, wait. Uh, Martin King? <coughs> you just made an illustration, it seems to me, of the, the, the lack of reality of this perception that communication thinks. That would affect things. If Iran has a nuclear weapon, would our threat or Israel's threat to attack them might not be credible? And therefore, isn't there a significant benefit to them to having a nuclear weapon? Well, attack them, it may success, may destroy their nuclear facility, maybe not. But no, no, I'm saying suppose they had a nuclear weapon okay. now and had the delivery means for it. Right. Wouldn't they be ad advantaged relative to where they are today compared to against the threats that Israel's making against them? 
would we have invaded Iraq had we known they had deliverable nuclear weapons in 2003? I don't think so. So yeah. there's a benefit to doing what they're doing from their point of view. And the benefit is having force to be able to resist force. I don't know that that uh, can solve any problem or conflict from, these, from, the, from the root cause. Because, uh, you mean, if they had a nuclear weapon and they had a de deliverable system, yeah. uh, then we try to stop them? No, no, or, no. No, or let them to use it? No, no, they've, they've got the delivery system, they've got the nuclear weapon now. How credible would Israel's threat to come and bomb them be? How credible is to, to, to bomb them? To them. I mean, if, if, if Israel knew that, that they had a nuclear weapon and could deliver it, right. would they be making this, these threats against Iran right now, that they're going to invade them and destroy their facilities? I don't think so. Nobody seems to be proposing that we do anything against North Korea, not because they've turned virtuous or, or fed their people better. Well, I think North Korea doesn't have a neighbor like Israel. Israel, at least I feel, they are willing to use whatever, maybe not nuclear weapon, but whatever tool to stop their uh, nuclear, to stop Iran's capability. Uh, that's well, I mean, they're, they're surely making those okay. threats. Yeah. But I, what I'm saying is, it wouldn't, if I were an Iranian, wouldn't I be in a much better position if I had a nuclear weapon of my own to use the, uh, to, to sit, confront Israel with the possibility that we'd retaliate with the nuclear weapon? If they follow the old thinking that the war is important, the military is important, and the then they probably think nuclear weapon is important. But if they follow the thinking of what I presented today, to have a nuclear weapon without nuclear weapon, it doesn't make a big difference. What, what do you think the chances that they'd agree with you are? Uh, right now, the chance is small, because I, I see most of the world, especially that part of the world, is uh, still uh, don't recognize military is is not very useful function. Okay, I've, I've, I've taken too much of your time. Okay. Where does the role of commerce and trade fit into your uh, exposition of communications? Does commerce and trade help facilitate? communications or can it be a hindrance? I think uh, both. Really, initially, yes, uh, it will facilitate the, the communication to let people start talking, start knowing each other. And then, uh, at the very end, there's a danger like uh, big cooperation dominates everything. Okay. And uh, then, it becomes the uh, king of the modern age. There's uh, something dominates the society. I think that's not very healthy to the to the world. Well, all right. Uh, yes, uh, Jeff. Try. With respect to your thesis about communication, I have to ask. I take it you're familiar with Radio Free Europe and, and, and the, the various outfits that were sending. Exist. Pardon? Does it still exist? It actually yes, does. It, it does. Yeah, but the, the point is that in the, in the Soviet Empire, Radio Free Europe presented an alternative, a starkly different point of view from the point of view presented by Soviet newspapers, but even more importantly, so I suppose, TV and radio. And what I'm wondering is, do you believe that there is anything comparable in our time, in the post-Soviet Empire era, where you have an alternative that is known to millions? Radio Free Europe became super famous all over the world, right? And, and, and everybody in the Soviet Empire knew of its existence. 
and they probably most of them knew how to tune into it on their radios. And that was presented a starkly different view of the world from the Soviet view of the world. And I'm wondering, do you, can you think of anything that exists now that presents as starkly a different view of the world to the American people, for instance, that the American people know about, that the peoples of the Soviet Empire experienced from outfits like Radio Free Europe. What's the Radio Free Europe of today? For, for the U.S. Right, for the U.S. How many, you know, Americans see and know of anything worth tuning into outside of the U.S. that presents a starkly different view of the world than what you're going to get from the mainstream media in the U.S.? How many, how many Americans bother to go then to Al Jazeera or any of the others? Yeah, I think uh, not a lot, because uh, there are so many uh, different opinions in this country already, so people don't feel uh, we are lack of information or lack of uh, 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 theories or uh, thoughts. I don't think so. But, uh, but uh, I think uh, you are right, still in this country I can see it's not lack of information but certainly some of the information can be biased because of lack of uh, interest to foreign countries. Like a U.S. country, within this country, people usually care more about this country only and uh, people doesn't know foreign country, doesn't know foreign culture, doesn't know uh, in versus other country usually knows more about this country than this country. Does that well, answer your question? Well, to a degree, but if there's no, if you don't have a line, I want to do a follow-up here to try to drive to Sure. When you say, okay, you just said that uh, that Americans, you know, they don't know or care that much about foreign countries. But what I'm trying to drive at is Radio Free Europe was telling the peoples within the Soviet Empire an awful lot about what was going on within the Soviet Empire. All right? right. And it's what I, I suspect is that the American people not only don't know enough about the rest of the world, it, it seems to me as though they don't know enough about what's happening here. And when you say that, well, there are all sorts of different opinions in this country, well, maybe the differences of opinion are along the lines of whether Coke is better than Pepsi. Okay? Maybe the differences of opinion are not as wide as they need to be given the actual truths about the human condition in general and the, the situation of this country in particular. I thought this was question time. Well, I'm trying to, uh, yeah, I'm trying to explain. Uh, what, uh, well, this is not okay. for explanation. All right, well, all right, but the, the, I'm in, in that light. Uh, all right, Roger, now I ask the question. What? I had my hand up two hours ago. I'm recognizing Raj, I'll recognize you next. Are we, are we over communicating now so that we cannot hear what is being said? Yeah, I think that that's another thing I didn't talk about it right now. It uh, can be over communication uh, in this society and in the modern society. But uh, people just need to get used to that and uh, learn how to sort out what's good information versus uh, uh, irrelevant information. I think that's a, a learning process. Uh, we look at the age of this group. We may not have that capability when we were young. and. Uh, we were at the age we looking for information, looking for 
communication. But now the young people, they, they <coughs> should handle better about uh, too much information and how to sort out the information, communication information. I think uh, that will change slowly. Okay, and then All right. Uh, um, Gene. Let's see, Gene. Uh, you mentioned yeah. that the majority of the people were against the war in Iraq. And we know that their uh, opposition was not recognized. Now, my question to you is why, and this is a rhetorical question, is why did the majority of the people that were against the Iraq war didn't have some influence on that decision of going to war? Now, the, 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 I said it rhetorical, but the simple reason is that some people uh, wanted to go to war. And those people that wanted to go to war <coughs> had the power and the tools and the foundation to go to war. Well, isn't it contradictory or uh, blind to overlook that fact that the people that make up the majority has no say? No power to enforce their say. I think, uh, first of all, I don't know how much of the population in this country uh, against the war or... You said the majority, I quoted you. You said the majority of the people. Now, <laughs> okay. now I don't question you said that, but all the major entities like newspaper or okay. televisions and who all, 99% yeah. was with the President for going to war. Yeah, I think what I said uh, was uh, when Bush decided to invade Iraq, and most of the people <coughs> in the country was against that. And uh, but once it started, and uh, then people just followed. Uh, for Iran, probably the same. For Iran, probably the same. If we right now, you ask people if people don't like war, and uh, then. But uh, if, uh, I don't know, Romney tends to be more aggressive uh, on that side, and uh, then if something uh, war started, maybe in this country still have strong enough patriotism, culture, and uh, loyalty culture, and uh, the whole country will support that. And uh, then got this country another uh, uh, problem. Uh, so I think uh, the people against the war didn't bring up enough evidence or uh, persuasive to to stop the war. If people say war is useless for Iran to stop their nuclear weapon. Think about this, if we go to the war and uh, bomb the, all of the city, Iran, and uh, then destroy their nuclear facility and the stop this time, are they going to continue? Yeah, they have the knowledge here to, to build another nuclear power, nuclear weapon. They will keep building that uh, in deeper and deeper tunnels and uh, within the mountains and uh, then someday they were successful because Technology is improving. Not just the country, uh, uh, maybe some individuals or some groups may be able to build uh, nuclear weapons in the future. The technology only improves to uh, progressively. So if you try to stop Iran to stop build, building nuclear weapons, the only way is to communicate them, say, nuclear weapon is useless to solve any conflict between them and the Israel. Okay. It will just kill lots of people and then make lots of people angry and at the end, I don't know how to stop uh, if Iran really wants to build a nuclear weapon. There's no way. In the long term, it's not successful. Uh, the short term might be rather awkward. <laughs> uh, Ivan Rueda. Uh, thank you. Um, 
what, what I think I draw it, and maybe I, I, I drew it inaccurately, uh, one of your premises is that by the increase of our, of our ability to communicate, and you kind of define that in terms of technology, right. newspapers, telephone, internet, Google, tweet, etc. Somehow our homo sapiens sapiens increase in our ability to communicate with each other uh, leads to this part of your premise, and maybe I'm inaccurate, but you, you can correct me right now. Somehow it'll stop war, uh, somehow it'll make less likely war. Uh, may, maybe I misheard you, but uh, I, it, let's assume that is accurate, my, the way I framed it. Uh, I'm, I'm at a loss as to why. Why the communication was I mean, war? If, if we could talk in the 1940s by telephone to our enemies and the German Reichstag right. and try to avoid a war, I mean, it was not an issue of communication. So we could send those same diplomatic communications by an email or a tweet. Yes. Uh, it, the methodology, the technical methodology of communication, I, I don't see the linkage with that, with stopping a war or making it less likely to go to war. Yeah, uh, the communication you're talking about is the communication between the leaders. Those are there before the Second World War, and the, certainly that didn't stop the Second World War. But the communication between the people was not there. And uh, I think that nowadays, because more uh, travel and the people knows each other more, and uh, you can, on the internet, you can see all the other countries, how they live, how they behave, what's their opinion, and uh, then the, the degree, the communication, the most important communication is between the people. Because of the ability to communicate within the people, as you suggest, does that yes. make it more or less likely that these extremist fringe groups with possible weapons of mass destruction will be less probable to exist or more probable to exist? Uh, certainly less probable to exist. Because, uh, okay, because basically those extreme groups like to uh, promote their ideas. They have a purpose. And can they not do that with the modern communication? They can do that with modern communication better when they realize they can do that with modern communication better than the explosives, better than terrorism uh, uh, methods, then they will go to modern communication instead of the, the, the terrorism uh, uh, methods. So they will follow the rule of the society, except, although they gave their extreme opinions on the internet, we let them do that, and uh, they, they had the way to express their opinion better, have a better effect by just killing people and everybody hates them. I remember, you know, the, these famous pictures of those Buddhist monks immolating themselves. Yes. It's quite a communicative message, and I'm not sure that can be duplicated viscerally on an email. If someone is willing to take their life for us, some type of religious purpose, and being able to send a mass email maybe won't do the trick. Yeah. You too. Uh, uh, but let's see, do we have any other questions? Yes, Victor. You know, I like the theory of communication, but sometimes I feel like it's overrated. The main thing for a country to have to succeed democracy for to succeed will have a to have a substantial middle <coughs> class. If you have an oligarchy or, or, or a ruling class in charge, chances are you're gonna no matter what kind of communication you have, you're gonna subvert it. E and even in this country, we think we have a free press. In fact we have a selected free press. Okay. How many of you can tell me, for instance, what is FARC, the Colombian rebel, fighting for? Anybody can explain what they're fighting about? 
I've been trying to read them for 40 years now, and I still don't know what they're fighting about. What kind of free press is that? It's a selective free press. So the subversion, the subversion of the communication something. There is an aspiration to, for democracy, and I believe in 1848, it was sweeping through Europe like it is sweeping now through the Arab world. This is the first one. But uh, how far it will go and how much of it it will be subverted, it's, it's in the future. Right, I think it takes time. The, tape, the time part is not the technology itself, it's uh, more on the culture itself. Like, this country has been democratic for almost 250 years, and uh, we are still have pretty strong idea about loyalty, patriotism, and uh, I think those are go against uh, democracy. And uh, if you look at other countries, they just uh, come from uh, autocracy or monarchy system. People are still believe in a society as a, a, a uniform, a united uh, uh, theme, follow one leader. And uh, so in those countries, uh, they may have parties, but between, within the party, it's uh, autocracy. And then between, it's pretty much like U.S. right now. Within the party, you try to be unit, unit, uh, united to against to the other party. So the party that is there, the democracy in this country. I'm not saying it's perfect. Actually, it's far from perfect. It can be improved a lot by the modern technology and. Uh, so, in your opinion, the, the uh, communication is selected, the press selected communication. It's 50 years ago, it's more selective. Nowadays, it's less selective. And uh, in the future, it can be, it can be better if you can publish in, on the web. Nobody stops you. The only thing is how much you can how much eyeballs you can catch, you can attract. Um, all right, Peter. Yes. So, uh, in your opinion, is democracy the highest evolved form of, of political organization? Uh, relative to autocracy or uh, in the old time of the, the monarchies, yes. But uh, I think democracy, there are lots of variation within the democracy, and uh, it, it will evolve in the future also. If you achieve perfect democracy, does that mean history stops? Mm, I don't think uh, history <laughs> will stop. And, uh, there's no, well, would it evolve into something else? Uh, quite possibly. Uh, is the, if technology changes or human behavior changes or human genes changes like uh, last uh, week's talk about uh, genetic modified food and maybe in the future will genetically modified human beings? Who knows? Alright, I think we're about ready to go to our rebuttal period. Uh, how many people here have remarks that they would like to make, or questions to raise, etc.? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, eleven. Well, at least eleven. Okay. Um, well, we'll start off with five minutes. Uh, a little bit. And uh, Bob Stiff, yes. we uh, want well, to thank Lee Ping for. Uh, yes. yeah, our speaker is definitely right. The improvement in communications <laughs> has made democracy practical beyond the level of the village. Uh, but he ignores an important thing 
about this clay temple that we always wear over our souls. We are corrupt. Mankind will always be moving for their selfish advantage. And without ignoring this position, I maintain that we do need a system whereby people are free to challenge other opinions. And he doesn't seem to really uh, do this. He wants it to somehow come about just by information. Now, he, he condemns monarchy. Actually, the real job of the king is to protect his people, like the natural father of the family. That has been always their position. Even the most despotic rulers, the Tsar, the Austrian Emperor, maintained that that was what they were about. Now, I'm very familiar with the Austrian-Hungarian Empire, and, and, that, and I've read a great deal about it. Uh, they maintained a fantastic secret service, but they didn't use it to suppress people. They used it to find out what the people were thinking. It's fantastic how it operated. Uh, but nonetheless, right down to the bitter end of the empire in 1914, the position of the emperor, he was an absolute monarch. Franz Joseph, the next to the last emperor, was interviewed a few years before his death and the end of the empire. And more or less, the newspaper reporter supposedly said something here like, Your Majesty, how do you look at your job? He says, well, my job is principally to protect my people against my government. It actually is a factual situation that he replied in some manner similar to that. Uh, democracy will not survive just on the ideal of democracy. I think that we do need, if it is to survive in the long run along these lines, we should not ignore the need for a class of people who are immune, as a good inspector general is made immune from corruption. And the royal families were one of the approach to that end. We don't need to reinstitute them necessarily today, but one of their principal functions was to provide protection for the people against the great Satan who prowls the earth, as it says in the Bible, to deceive mankind. And that will always be with us. And we cannot take such an ideal position for granted just on the basis of improved communication. <coughs> is a position with which I strongly disagree. There is no great Satan. Um, Li Ping Shen Chong Shi Iga Megu Ren Hun Song Ming Shi Shi. Li Ping's analysis is correct. He was looking, I believe, at uh, the development of communication, of peaceful uh, aspirations up to the present time. But Looking forward, what are we going to do from here on in? Um, to answer one of Jeff's uh, questions, uh, how are we going to do it with the, uh, the control of the press by uh, entities that we don't like? Well, Wikipedia is a very good example of that. And uh, the Wikipedia founder, Asange, is, uh, is under... Uh, is hiding in the Ecuadorian embassy in Britain because Sweden wants him on trumped up charges, the United States wants to get him for sedition, uh, his, comp his uh, associates who are whistleblowers in the United States are already under indictment for treason. Uh, so Wikipedia is the type of uh, operation that will inform the population of the world and the United States of just what's going on. Um, the Israeli-Arab war in the 60s is a good example, I think, of 
the conflict between ancient monarchies in the pre-communication uh, uh, era with the modern uh, communication era. Uh, the monarchies of the Arab world uh, thought that their numbers and their loyalty would defeat Israel and give them uh, uh, a free reign to control the Middle East. It didn't work out that way uh, because of the superior technology and commitment of the Israeli people. Now, the monarchies of the Arab world wanted to then, after, the, after losing the war, they wanted to take advantage of the communication era rules of war. You have to stay in your own boundaries. You have to go back to your boundaries. You can't seize land through conquest and so forth. And I think that the, the uh, United Nations and the world needs to resolve that problem by forcing Israel back to its original 67 borders and then negotiate from there with the Palestinians. Um, world War I and World War II were fought uh, not between democracies or between uh, monarchies or anything like that. It was fought principally between two entities, finance capital and manufacturing capital. Manufacturing capital lost, and they paid huge reparations to the finance capital world. World War II was the same situation. Again, the manufacturing capital uh, country represented uh, by Germany uh, attempted to uh, control the rest of uh, the modern world unsuccessfully, as it turns out, fortunately for us. Um, but the, the, in, the, in the communication era that we're in now, propaganda plays a very, very important role in what we are given to understand, what we are allowed to understand, as Jeff and others pointed out. But one of the principal guidance, guiding uh, lights of my life is we get what we deserve. Thanks, uh, Speaker. Uh, very enlightening, very interesting. Uh, with regard to the rebuttal that just was, was before me, uh, the United States wasn't bad in manufacturing in, at the start of World War II either, nor was the Soviet Union. They were both pretty strong manufacturing countries. Uh, uh, one way to rake countries on democracy is Freedom House. Uh, if you, uh, I've got a book from I think tw uh, 2007 that ranks all the countries, uh, and you can I think look it up on the internet. I couldn't figure out how to get it, so I got the book itself. But uh, roughly a third of the countries are listed as free, very free. And then a uh, third, roughly, something like that, are partly free. And then uh, about a third are unfree, something like that. Uh, uh, as far as uh, communication, I think the speaker's got some good points. But in World War I, uh, the communication, and uh, Tim mentioned uh, commerce and trade, Communication and commerce and trade in Europe were very, very well integrated. That's in two books, uh, Niall Ferguson's War of the World and John Cogan on the uh, World War I. So they were all pretty well uh, uh, integrated. The communication was very, very good. And still, these, uh, the war occurred. Um, now, uh, where can you go for other information? Well, I agree that most Americans, at least my opinion is, most Americans, at least the majority of Americans, don't seem to watch anything but a few, uh, read a few books or read a few uh, newspapers or uh, TV or radio. But there's plenty of stuff you can easily get. I'm not too technical, but I mean, uh, you can get uh, BBC, you can uh, write on the TV set, you can get uh, World News at 10 o'clock on Channel 20, and 
uh, my dear friend Francoise gets uh, fr uh, news from France in French. So you can pretty easily, if you really want it, now most people ignore all of that, or a lot of people. I, I don't know that no more speak, but a lot of people <coughs> seem to ignore all of that and just watch two, five, seven, and nine, or or uh, other uh, channels that have entertainment. <laughs> Iraq and Iran. There were plenty of people who were against both uh, uh, Iraq war, me, my church, uh, South Siders for Peace formed at that time. So I don't feel lonely in being against that war. Iran, well, I've already written a letter on that, and I don't think I'm lonely either. Huge numbers of people think it would be a really stupid idea to go to war with Iran. But boy, I wouldn't hold my breath. It's likely to happen. So I'm glad for what the speaker said. I'm not quite as optimistic as he is. Thank you. You are a very nice guy. <laughs> That's your problem, you know. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> we communicate here and we can kill each other. Uh, uh, he should not have gone into political political area. He should have gone that, you know, that Africa they are able to communicate so that they, they can get know where to get a medicine and where to get a uh, where, where flood is coming or where uh, where the something is there or not there or India they are communicating to uh, where vegetables are and where they where they needed it and all those things it would have worked anyway but uh, I don't think theorem is proved uh, which you try, you try to prove. And I, I, I promised Mr. Charles Fredak, I told him that uh, I thought uh, in a presidential candidates, uh, Romney has a better character than Obama. So he told me that, would you tell that to College of Complexes? And so I just told you. Okay. What I mean was that in a political character, I guess both candidates lack the character. You know, I don't think that they are being honest with us. I do not think they understand the issues. I do not think they present the solutions or they have no solutions. And I think they both are kind of a loners. You know, they don't they don't talk to people, you know, who can have some ideas or really I mean that it's a it's a it's a pathetic, it's a sickening and uh, and uh, somehow those who like Obama, I, I do not know. I mean, how can you like somebody and not like some of his policy? Or maybe you like his policy, you know. But uh, we are in a big trouble, and uh, uh, and some of our, our teachers are not here, but I'd like to say something about our teacher's uh, contract. And uh, that is uh, emblematic of what is happening in a country. In a teacher's contract, they were talking about uh, you, you teacher's evaluation, I understand, you know. I did that in a college when I was there. But uh, I think teachers should be paid only 50% of what they are paid and demanding 50% on the results. We want results. We want kids come out of the school, okay, they are ready for college. They can add 3 plus 5 equal to 8 or something. If they go to buy apples and they want to buy two apples and their guy says ten dollars a dozen, they can figure it out. We know those, we know that uh, they get some knowledge. Un unfortunately, into every single area in this country, we are not trying to solve a problem. We are a country of perception. You know what you perceive as a good or what I like that. You know, oh my God, how can <laughs> How can Ramni say that, you know, it looks really, really bad, you know? Come on, damn it, solve the problem, I, you know? Don't, uh, don't tell me it looks bad, you know? If a, if a, 
and a, and a candidate, whatever candidate says, it means nothing. Obama said uh, during 2008 that he is against uh, mandate. Either he did not understand or he was lying. <coughs> okay. And he imposed a mandate in his uh, health care uh, reform. And uh, I mean, he shook so hands with uh, John McCain long before he was likely to be candidate that if, if if a, if a McCain and Obama will be the opposite candidates each other in 2008, they both will not, they take a, what you call it, a federal financing of a general election. But Obama was raising billions and millions of dollars, so he refused. Okay? Now that is character, you know, that lack of character. Okay? To me, I shake a hand with somebody, it's as good as gold. And if two senators of United States of America, they shake a hand and they decide they take a hand on some important national issue and they do not, one of them doesn't have a guts to follow it up, that is a lack of character to me. And that makes one unfit to hold a presidential office. Thank you. Uh, yeah, there are people that are speakers, they call them, they help me out, when you get older you get, can't remember things, but they speak to an audience to uplift them. Motivational. Huh? Motivational, motivational speakers. speakers. Huh? Inspirational, motivational. Motivational. Uh, motivational speakers. And they all come up and they're very articulate and they speak and they say, there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. The speaker, I would have to put in that kind of category because he's a good man, an honest man, and he sounds sincere. And when a person is that, what can you, uh, you, you can't uh, uh, attack them with full force because they are humans and they, they speak and think based on their experience or their conclusion, what they've seen and so forth and so on. I, but when he's used communication, in wall to explain some of the things he did. Uh, I have a little problem with that. In other words, uh, communication and technology are going to save us from the devil. And I'll tell you who the devil is, or at least uh, who, who is the, who, what the pronouns stand for. Uh, the people. Uh, Theoretically, had, could have a lot of power and do a lot of things. Ever since the beginning of time, man has known that. That's why people are more important than anything else for the guy in charge or the guys in charge. King, Queen, Presidents, heads of state, etc. Like that. The people are very important because. There's a force there and a potential, a potential power there that can change the whole landscape. However, <coughs> we overlook what we have seen in red. Human beings have a tendency to be just what they are. Blind, distracted, led anywhere, divided, and so forth. The guy in charge has always known that. So guess what? The least thing he's afraid of is those people having the power, for, first of all, he doesn't have the power, to do anything about his decision. However, theoretically, again, they could be a force against him if they un united. Ain't no 10 people can do shit with 10 million. So if they united, but they will never <coughs> unite it because the man in charge, then gave them other things, told them other things, and gave them other things, physical things, that is more important than human beings. One of our biggest problems, they think if you got a fistful of dollars, everything's going to be all right. But if you ain't shit, an asshole, ain't nothing, 
without the dollar, all you're going to be is the same shit with the head full, full of dollars. So what they do is take your confidence away, strip you of your ability <coughs> to be somebody, and pass that, I yell at put the psychology of transference to another person that's supposed to save you. Now how in the hell can you stand here, sit there, and look for some other human being to save you? Now, where does that come from? We have been around too long, like Bob mentioned earlier, we have been around too long to think that human beings are saints, they can't be tempted, they can't be bought, they can't be distracted, give me a goddamn break, please. We have seen that. You got to read those books. You have seen that. Now, in order to overcome, he used the bottom up. And he was talking in old times when the top was so and so. Well, we ain't never been so top heavy, Mr. Speaker, as we are now. If you think the king and queen was in charge, you should see who in charge now. And, and, and they own all the tools that they need to do what they are doing. And take my word for it, most of what they're doing is right out here where I can see it. I ain't got to read no goddamn books. It's right out here for all us to see. But guess what? The Stockholm Syndrome, the abuse, wife complex, the where can I go? Stop us, most of us, a lot of us, from looking at what the truth is. I'm saying there's no way that you can solve a problem if you're going to have to remove somebody over here that you're not capable of moving because your strength ain't strong enough, your method ain't as uh, accurate and important as it should be, you're going to be in the same position tomorrow that you're in today. So it, uh, uh, that uh, uh, inspirational speaking, uh, I don't, it's okay, but in a forum like this, I don't like that because uh, I think uh, uh, people here should be a little more respected than being motivated. They should be uh, kind of communicated with and so forth. Well, you know, use the microphone. The, uh, in uh, Hebrews 13, 16, uh -oh. Uh -oh. Uh, it says to do good and to communicate, forget not, for with such service God is well pleased. Now, the communication there was a matter of sharing. To do good is to do good to those around you, uh, to share, to give of yourself. Well, that's important. And, and all communication is some sharing. It's a sharing of our ideas, our alarm, our Hopes, our fears, whatever. And the more we communicate, the more we, we have a, a community. So uh, and if you want to build community, uh, you need to do communication. So, uh, I, I think that Li Ping is absolutely right that uh, the uh, building of community is a matter of communication. But it's not just communication, it's also a matter of doing good. <laughs> and what is it to do good? What is good? You know, we have differences of opinion about what's good or what's good to do. And uh, 
and, and we can understand what it is to do good uh, by communicating. Uh, and when we uh, find that what is being done by others uh, offends us, we had better communicate that uh, it, we are offended. Uh, if we don't, <coughs> how are we ever going to be reconciled? <coughs> Therefore, you know, uh, nation states have ambassadors and consuls and all sorts of representatives to each other. And, you know, we do have communication to uh, the rest of the world, whether it's uh, Radio Free Europe or, or uh, uh, Radio... Uh, what is it? Uh, I had a friend whose uh, parents worked for. Uh, what? What is it? Uh, we mentioned it earlier in the, this evening. Uh, oh, this is uh, 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 radio, radio Free Europe. Radio Free Europe. America. Voice the Voice of America. Of America. The Voice of America. Yes. Uh, well, and, and we're not alone in this. Uh, the uh, British have the BBC, and uh, the Canadians have the Canadian Broadcasting Company, and uh, China has uh, uh, foreign CCTV. language uh, broadcasts, and Radio Moscow. You know, the world, you know, the, the French, the Germans, I mean, you, you can get Deutsche Welle uh, on, uh, uh, on TV, on, what is it? Uh, Channel 20. Uh, uh, 20. CC. Uh, WYCC. WYCC. Yes. Uh, uh, and all that helps. Um, but building peace is a matter of a whole lot of communication and a whole lot of doing good. All right? Okay. What All right, thanks to Kane for, for giving a very nice presentation. Um, I think that, uh, unfortunately, Democracy, at least in our experience, can sow the seeds of its own destruction. Uh, for instance, uh, well, uh, the Wagner Act. You know, uh, by you know, there's a there's a link between socialism and totalitarianism. All totalitarianism starts out as socialism, and it just progresses. And this is when you take the decision-making out of the marketplace and give it to somebody in government, some governmental authority. And the use of oppression, you know, to, to uh, implement that. And like I said, for instance, you know, the Wagner Act, uh, which now gives, uh, you know, uh, labor, uh, the power of the government, power to come in and force, co use coercion to force a company to accept, uh, a, you know, a, a union contract. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That's, that's coercion. I mean, that's, that's against everything that we stand for. We want voluntary, you know, we want people acting in their own interest to, you know, volunt voluntarily enter into contracts, uh, you know, for their own best interest. And what do we have with something like that? that that's, that's coercion. That's the government now stepping in, taking that decision out of the marketplace. And every time, every time the government does, you know, starts making these decisions, there's somebody now planning. You know, all, what's, what is Nazism, communism, fascism, 
you know, all those isms other than capitalism, what, are they, what, they, all, what they all have in common is the government doing economic planning and then having, instead of using the market price, our market uh, place and the price mechanism to let people decide things, the government tries to do it. I'm reading an excellent book right now called uh, FDR or Franklin Roosevelt and the New Deal. And boy, the Roosevelt administration tried this. They had these, these uh, they called them uh, codes. They had a, uh, they had a, for every type of industry, they had like a little committee that was going to try to regulate them and tell them what to do. They had, they had committee, even had committees for, for burlesque dancers and, and theaters. You know how many how many scripts there could be per <laughs> show, and things like that. And this was an enormous task for us. And they realized that they had they had to have a code book for you know for rice growers and a, a code book for shoemakers, you know, manufacturers. So try to regulate, you know, how many shoes were going to be made and how much, uh, you know, how much the, the workers were going to make and how many you know how, much, how many hours they would be allowed to work in a particular place. And, all. and it was just. An enormous manual test. Think of the government doing that stuff <laughs> instead of the marketplace, which does it so much more efficient and better. So, so besides that, you also have the thing that you know the thing that rich people are always worried about. This is why wealthy people are always fighting taxes, is because you know in a democracy you get enough people together and they're going to vote for somebody in that's going to you know tax the wealthy, take you know take from them and give to me. So whenever we have this, these periods like we're in now, where we have want in a time of you know of plenty, there's always politicians that want to come along and take away the plenty. So, so the seeds of our destruction are kind of sowed in there. Now, one thing though about communications, it sure helps when you you know to, to fight these totalitarian regimes, as we're seeing with the with the Arab Spring and all that going on. Uh, it's much easier for, uh, you know, uh, uh, insurgents and things like that to communicate, revolutionaries to, you know, get together and organize and all that to fight these oppressive regimes. Uh, by the way, now, speaking of Iran and Iraq and all that, folks, we're, we've been at war with Iran since 1979, if you haven't noticed. They're the ones that were behind the Beirut bombing, you know, of, uh, 1982 that killed all these Marines. They're the ones that have funded and supplied terrorist organizations, Hezbollah and Hamas. Uh, and they're, you know, they're, they're very anxious to continue that in the future. And what we've been trying to do is avo avoid a hot war, you know, a ground war with them. Uh, because they've got like 70 million people, it would be a big, long, nasty war. So if we have time later, or maybe another evening, I can come back and talk about the justification for the Iraq War and why that was a central component okay. in our war against Iran and our ultimate success. Plenty of commentary, trust me. All right. First of all, before I get to the main burden of my remarks, I'm going to respond first to the views of the Hoosier in the room. <laughs> I find his I find his views of Franklin Roosevelt both myopic and trite. Uh, it's true that Franklin Roosevelt did try what he said. Bob said they did under the rule under the National Recovery Administration, and that those rules were eventually abandoned as being unworkable. But having said that, Franklin Roosevelt gave this gave the people of this country a greater share in what they produced. And I heartily call the Wagner Act an example of totalitarianism. <laughs> On the contrary, it enabled uh, the working people of this country to stand up against the bullies in Wall Street and in big business, including the people like Henry Ford, and it gave them rights, including the right to strike. 
and the right to stand up, and the right to a say in what went on in the workplace, which I think they're entitled to. Now, as to the uh, main comments on my remarks. I enjoyed your talk, and I found it very informative. But I don't know that communication alone is responsible for the world's problems or lack of it. And I don't know that lack of communication alone, or that communication alone, can bring us peace. Uh, first of all, I don't feel that loyalty or patriotism, per se, is bad. I agree that there need to be two kinds of loyalty or patriotism. A loyalty that is enlightened and rational, and which people still think, versus the unswerving loyalty of the narrow-minded boo who doesn't think, who just goes along blindly. Now, it's true that Germany suffered from this during, world, during the, the Nazi era, and they followed Hitler blindly to their destruction. But the person who says he's loyal to the United States, or who works at a job for 30 years as I did, I'm sorry, I don't buy the argument that there's anything wrong with that. Uh, with regard to the comments that were made about Francis Gary Powers in the U-2, uh, he didn't stay in Russia of his own volition. And it wasn't because the United States didn't want him back. When his plane crashed and he bailed out, he was arrested by the Russians for espionage. And he was convicted in a Soviet court and sentenced to a lengthy prison term. We got him back because we swapped him for a spy of theirs that we were holding who went in this country under the name Rudolf Abel. Though that apparently was not his real name. Uh, most of us who grew up in a certain era are familiar with Radio Free Europe. There were endless public service announcements about it on television when I was a boy. And I don't doubt that the people of the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe tried to listen to it, that is, when it wasn't jammed. Uh, everyone remember my age remembers a certain PSA for this, where you heard an announcer speaking in, a, in some Eastern European language that ended in the word Broadway. And that was a song introduction because the next thing you heard was the Drifters recording of, of On Broadway. Um, indeed, communication sometimes can help totalitarianism. That's how Hitler had no trouble communicating with the German people of his time. And that's part, and because he did it so well, and because he had an excellent propaganda minister, Joseph Goebbels, <laughs> that's why they followed, part of why they followed him so blindly. I also don't agree with the idea that monarchy is always about the king protecting his people. Monarchs can be corrupt like everybody else. If we, we want an example, look how George III dealt with his American colonies. Finally, I will, and I would also say that much of the problems of the Middle East, at least in a certain era, again, as many of us will remember, were due not to feudal Arab monarchs, but to the new rise of Arab nationalism under people like Gamal Abdel Nasser, who was not talked about much anymore. He died, after all, over 40 years ago. But I would argue that his influence is still felt in certain circles in the Middle East, and that some of the problems we have with that, with, in that part of the world are not due to the rise of fundamentalist Islam, though that's certainly part of it, but also to the ideals that Nasser communicated. Finally, yes, finally, Brown, I know my time is running out. I think that most of you have seen the movie Cool Hand Luke. And I don't entirely disagree with you. I do say that at least some of life's problems are articulated in that memorable line that the brutal prison captain played by Struther Martin said in the movie. What we have here is a failure to communicate. <laughs> you see that uh, David heard the communication, but it didn't mean compliance. <laughs> and that's uh, one big issue it. with, uh, you know, knowing or, or having the mere information, mere data about something, but having your interest, uh, your impulses, or, or your needs somewhere else. Um, 
communication, democracy, and war um, should be addressed differently. They, are, um, they should not be addressed interchangeably. And some of you, some of the people here mentioned why. Um, and um, uh, one of them is that communication is a tool, among other things, a tool to organize. And you can, uh, as uh, Ivan uh, here who left uh, mentioned, um, the uh, organization of, of terrorist groups uh, is as equivalent to organization of um, um, peace movements. So, um, corruption, uh, I think somebody here suggested as a solution to choose corruption-proof leaders. Oh. Well, if anything like that would exist, it will be robots. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I'm not kidding, because so. you can, yeah, you can program a robot to do a certain test, a robot will not have an ego, a robot will not have excessive aggression, only defensive. So uh, that's, I think, it's a very good solution. Uh, as far as the loyalty, uh, David, I think that what um, the speaker meant, he addressed the issue of authoritarianism. And that's a very, very big issue with humans. And Jean and I always bring it up. Um, I don't think that is uh, any time it, it will go away. It's in our hardware. It's a survival. It was one of the survival mechanisms. And um, we'll have to deal with it. And true, it is related to democracy uh, because Authoritarianism is basically surrendering of the critical thinking. Uh, and that's a way to control the media. Um, now, communication itself can be a way to control the media and can be a form of authoritarianism. If it is very obvious, very overt, uh, it is in a monarchy. But in our times, it's very covert and subtle through this media that actually reinforces certain authoritarianism by having uh, different idols and fashions and, and other um, and ideas, very superficial, of course, to follow. Um, and it kind of hypnotizes people that's a very effective world, uh, form of communication, hypnotizing people to behave in certain ways or to believe certain ways that would be beyond reason, which you uh, advocate. Uh, as long as our main survival is, uh, is power, we will have underdogs and top dogs. And the top dog is, does not have a very uh, good advantage or position to communicate with top dog. And so history, if we look at history and the presence, we see that there is no choice, uh, no other option for underdogs to communicate but with violence. And many times it is the preferred mode because what violence is a kind of a negative value uh, for many people, not all, um, but it has to be weighed against social justice, okay? uh, repression, uh, slavery, human rights. Uh, so to, to regain, like the French Revolution, uh, you know, sometimes uh, violence is the way to to improve people's life. I think. Okay, I'll be in compliance.
Okay, well, in the first instance, I want to associate myself with Gene Anderson's remarks, for starters, about how we don't want to be too hard on this guy. But, but, and as you know, your distinction in the first instance between the age of pre communication and the age of communication is good, okay, as far as it goes. Uh, but, uh, what you're missing is a crucial distinction between the forms of communication that you just lumped together. <clears throat> I suggest that there's a huge difference between print communication and audiovisual communication. And this really showed in how history moved in roughly the period from Luther to, as Dave brought to our attention, Herr Hitler. Luther relied on the printing press to make, you know, thousands of copies of the 95 theses, and the Pope, I'll wager, didn't know where all those printing presses were. And that was decisive. So you could have guys on horseback running, riding through the, the, the empire, the Holy Roman Empire, those days, just flinging these things out of, out of pouches, and the folks were able to read what Luther had to say, instead of just hearing what the Pope had to say. Whereas before the printing press, the Pope, the, the, the Pope or the Emperor would have an army of scribes, and his opponents wouldn't. And so the whistleblowers got lost in the shuffle, such as it was. Between Luther and then you got the Founding Fathers and all and that whole period of hundreds of years, the whistleblowers, guys like Luther and Tom Paine, were able to get a word in edgewise, because the Pope and King George didn't know where all the printing presses were. But by the time Hitler started, and by the time he came to power, there was radio stations. And he and his buddies knew where all those things were. And they could go and they could take him over. And Hitler could get his spin out there, and his opponents had no chance to, to counter his spin on stuff. And that made all the difference in the world. Now, with, there was no radio-free Germany in the States back then. So the guys in, this, in D.C. figured out, well, okay, we better create radio-free Europe and other stuff. And the Soviets, therefore, were not able to have the monopoly on the debate in their empire that Hitler had in his. All right? And that's why it took a world war to whoop him, whereas the Soviets were brought down, you know, a stunningly peaceful end. It was through the, the ability to break the monopoly of agenda-setting propaganda that Hitler relied on. The Soviets relied on it too, and it worked for a few decades with them. But that there was a radio for Europe, etc. And it had nothing to do with it. They, you know, there was all sorts of ways to get the Soviets and Eastern European peoples to doubt the Soviets spin on things. Those ways were not available to the opponents of Hitler. And here we are, and I ask you the question, is there an equivalent of a radio-free Europe in our time? And you conceded no. And that's making all the difference in the world. The powers that be in this country are able to waltz around, short of raping an 80-year-old lady in broad daylight at State Madison, they can do whatever they damn well please. And they are. And they're running this joint into the ground. And the, the political winds, you know, the, 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 the Constitution's falling apart, the middle class is falling apart. Back 50 years ago, you had anti-Vietnam demonstrations here and around the world, and there was all sorts of communication back and forth about that. When you still had a strong printing press, the TV was just sort of getting started. All right? Well, now you've got 24-7 TV. Yes, I understand it. You had massive demonstrations against the Iraq War all over the world. The American people knew virtually nothing of that. Right. They saw the president and the vice president and his allies on TV damn near 24-7, but they knew virtually nothing of the magnitude of the opposition around the world to those guys' policies. Now, that's a decisive change. Nowadays, you know, if a, if a Walter Cronkite or a Dan Rather gets out of line, the president probably doesn't even have to pick up the phone. 
all right? The tea leaves get red, and the brass at CBS figure out it's in their interest to bounce guys like that and put in guys like Tim Russert, who are ass kissers for the most part. Okay, that's modern journalism, thanks to TV and radio, and I'll, I'll be, I'm sure I'll need more time to elaborate on this stuff. If you look at the writings of Thomas P. M. Barnett, what Li Ping has contended is probably possible. His work, called The Pentagon's New Map, outlines war strategy for the next hundred years or so. And he has been saying that countries that are connected together, I mean having a modern economic system with computerized communication, with a modern economy makes war between them of a cost of almost too high. We're not going to be seeing another major power war because of the fact that the countries are trading, they're communicating, and they're talking in a large sense. There's a lot more to it than that, but that is the premise of Barnett's work. Secondly, he also divides the world into those countries that are not plugged in to the modern communication grid, namely those in Central Africa, some of the Middle Eastern regimes, and some of the countries out in the uh, South Pacific air Rim area, not specifically Singapore and that, but some of the more remote <coughs> areas. And as a country develops, and plugs into the world, the chances of war go down. I don't really have a lot of time to get into the work or reasoning behind it, but I think Li Ping has done a major factor in why we're not going to see some kind of peace moving forward. On another note, I happen to be in a voluntary organization that promotes communication and personal empowerment. And that's called Toastmasters International. And in a lot of cases when you see that, communication is not only essential for countries and world people, but it can also be very empowering to yourself. For your ability to communicate your ideas, your premise, and to listen to others has a direct impact on the quality of your life. Now our Chicago area has over 225 individual Toastmasters clubs that can help any one of you benefit to improve your own communication skills. Li Ping's a member, and I think Li Ping did a decent job tonight in communicating his ideas to the college. I've been a member since 2000. I would not be standing up here being as clear and articulate as I would without the help and support of that organization. So, if you get nothing out of this tonight, take a good, long, hard look at the fact that communication, both personally professionally and between countries actually works to help empower lives getting better. And if you want to know one of the best, most modern forms of effective communication, I just dare you to take a look at that one, that infomercial. How many people call in on those things? Thank you very much. I think he's absolutely totally on the money when he says that, you know, modern communication. I believe that communication between peoples and countries is the only hope we have to avoid 
descending into violence when it's been known for a long time. And uh, the, the detective Kojak on TV used to end a lot of his programs uh, with Law and Order way back 30 years ago saying, when are people going to learn? When is City Hall going to learn? And where you have no justice, you get violence. And uh, a lot of people in America are getting to that point now when, especially right now, um, suicide is at an all-time high with our troops coming home from Iraq and Afghanistan. They come home to America and they find uh, they're faced with two basic realities. Number one, they have no hope of getting a living wage job in America. Many of them are homeless. Two, they have uh, no hope of uh, getting a kind of help and support for living indoors. Many of them are homeless. We don't have a social safety net in this country. Other countries do. I've just got a few quick notes I've been making. Uh, you know, there's not enough time to stress all kinds of things, but to hit the high points. Number one, it doesn't matter what we think if we don't do anything. We can all disagree with what the government is doing and everything else, but if we sit back and do not take any effective action of some kind, then the 2%, 1% of the psychopaths at the top that have the billions, they're going to run wild and just eliminate the middle class and push us back into third world status. I'm a coach for 7th graders, science. Uh, we teach 7th graders in order to solve any problem you have to first correctly identify the problem. I've given talks here for five years. I've been handing out fact-based, every one of my talks has been fact-based. Here's a piece of communications that costs 15 cents. It's a card from architects and engineers. At least it lists the top 10 characteristics of controlled demolition seen in New York. We still have people from this audience coming up here and standing at the podium saying, oh, uh, we were attacked by Osama on 9-11. Right. Well, that's a giant crock of BS. And uh, I don't know which is more offensive, the fact that you keep standing up here at the podium and saying that, or if you're comfortable parading that level of ignorance out in public. At some point, we have to address the fact that we have many fellow Americans are living in a bubble of mythology where other countries are moving forward, taking care of their people, uh, providing jobs, food, shelter, universal health care, universal education. There's good things going on all over the world. And we wouldn't know about that by looking at the American press. We, we, we find it through the internet, right? Books, magazine articles. Uh, anybody that wants any of my new cards, I, I just got some new cards with a new post office box. They have the portal websites on them. Portal websites are a doorway into the world where all the blacked out news is. Project Censored's book is coming out uh, in a couple of weeks. It'll have the top 25 blacked out stories of the year. I've said this over and over again, and I don't think I can stress it enough, that uh, in America, not enough people ask the, the question, what's wrong? What's wrong with allowing a man to say, I can't send my kid to the college with any security because I only got $30 billion in the bank? I, as an owner, I need another 50, 60 billion before I can feel secure for my wife and two kids. That's, that's not greed. That's a psychopathic, sociopathic tendency. These people uh, are way beyond greed. They have, uh, they have mental illness problems, and if we don't address it as a society, we're going down the tube. They've already moved 60,000 factories overseas. Kids are coming out of college now with good educations in a lot of kinds of fields. They're coming back to live with mom and dad because the jobs are not in America. They're not on our soil anymore. They're in India, uh, Pakistan, uh, China. And of course, as an American, you can't go over to China and get a job. There's a whole bunch of other people ahead of you. They take care of their people. And one final point. Give me another 15 seconds. Uh, where he, I agree with our speaker absolutely saying war is obsolete. Uh, nobody in their right mind today would launch a nuclear missile at any country that has more missiles than they do. When you launch one through the air, the satellites flying around can trace where it was launched from. Launching a If Iran were to launch a nuclear missile, 
it would declare, it would be a suicidal statement of that country, just inviting the rest of the world with, with uh, you know, comparable weapons just to blow them away. So this is all just one big uh, dog and pony show they're uh, pushing in the media in America to get us to support the idea that our troops can go and uh, invade Iran or you know, have Israel do it for the oil. It's all about oil and power. And it's time, you know, the, the evidence is everywhere. Anybody that wants to learn, wants to pull their head out of the clouds and stop living in a bubble of mythology, there are just millions of, well, maybe thousands of good sources, tens of thousands of sources on the internet, books, articles, all kinds of things. And as I said, uh, this, this blue flyer has the four most, uh, what we consider the biggest myths in America that people are living under at the time. They're up here on the table. If you want to take it with you, you know, if you want, call us for information. I'd be more than happy to help. Thank you. Yeah, well, a mention was just made of the web, and there's all sorts of things on the web. And the web is, in principle, it's, it's by far and away the best place in town. Now, there's so much of it, and it's all over the place, that one doesn't know where to begin unless one gets lucky, and that's part of the problem. The American people, insofar as they know boo about the options on the web, have no idea how to go about determining which ones are better than the other ones. And so it's, it's needles and, haste, and haystacks. And therefore, while the web, in certain respects, is, is a fantastic thing if you know what you're doing, if you don't know what you're doing, you're a babe in the woods, and you're still putty for the Tim Russers of the world. And so the American people, the overwhelming preponderance of the American people, are still putty for the Russers and the W's and all of these people. And because W had no trouble looking up the address of CBS, and the dudes, <laughs> the brass at CBS knew that good and damn well, they knew that there was only so much guff that W was going to take from guys like Dan Rather. And in due course, Dan Rather was replaced by a yes man. And that is the story of our time. But it's not the only story of our time. You can go back decades about the economy, as an example. We were told all these decades, after the 70s, when there was the oil shocks, price shocks, we were told, oh, there's all sorts of recoveries. We're in the new economy. Right. Well, yeah, we were in a new economy. It was an economy that was completely unsustainable, that was based on, a, on the greatest orgy of debt in human history. It was a fake. Insofar as there was a recovery, it was completely fake. And insofar as anything was accomplished with it at all, it was accomplished by drilling baby drilling in irreplaceable resources. And so now here we are. We'll be lucky if industrial civilization lasts a couple more decades. Because the sinews of that civilization are being, pardon my French, pissed away. But the American people don't understand this. Now, oil was 15 bucks a barrel, and now it's closer to 100, right? But we're told, oh, don't worry. We're still in a recovery, and things are going to be OK just like they've always been. Well, that's a view which, according to many very knowledgeable people, is laughably uh, optimistic, Pollyannish, and which will in due course be shown to be a joke. But the American, none of these, these vital facts are almost never presented to the American people, least of all, as I understand it, on radio and TV. You can find these kind of things on the web if you know where to look, but that's about it. And so the whistleblowers are being systematically marginalized. And the powers that be have a free run almost as complete as the kings and the emperors did in the age of pre-communication to which you refer. And until there shows up an equivalent of Radio Free Europe to blow the whistle on the powers that be in this country, like the whistle got blown on the communist dictators, the American people are headed for doom. Okay, And the only question is whether they'll be chaplain slaved or starved first. How many of each? That's where it's going because 
there's no truth telling in this society. The propagandists get up on TV and radio 24 7 and cover for the powers that be. That's their job. And those who would blow the whistle on them can write all the posts on the web they want. But those posts may be read, if we're lucky, if they're lucky, by 1% of the population. The overwhelming majority of the population doesn't know anything other than to turn a switch for either the boot tube or the radio. And so they get the same talking heads, you know, in some cases, literally five days a week, in many cases, five days a week. The same crowd, and that crowd, whether you're talking about Rush Limbaugh or David Broder, those guys have been around for decades. Chances are they'll be continuing to spew, continuing to spew the stuff till they drop. All right, but there's been virtually no change other than a few, you know, marginal changes here and there. When a Russer dies, okay, someone has to take his place. But the, this, I've seen no change in the mentality at all. If anything, it's gotten worse. At least there were the Dan Rathers of the world causing some sort of trouble every now and then. But now, even you know, even they're gone. You've got virtually nobody um, making, getting to make any comment at all about these monstrous elephants in the room, the National Defense Authorization Act, etc. It's, it, it's a joke. It's a caricature. Okay. Um, <clears throat> all right. Well, I, I didn't hear the lecture tonight. So yeah. Well, that, that's right. That's my name. Uh, anyway, I didn't hear the lecture tonight. But, um, but that's never stopped anybody from giving a rebuttal speech. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, now, I guess the I guess the lecture tonight was about um, was about democracy, and I guess the United States is supposed to be a democracy now, um, which I, I'd like to think that it is. But um, but I had a very interesting experience at Walmart that um, today actually that uh, um, that I think illustrates where the real power in this country lies, and that's with the multinational corporations. That they are so big that they're actually, many of them have a higher gross domestic product than some countries. I think some of our, I think our biggest multinationals have a higher gross domestic product than Greece, for example, Spain or Portugal or any of those small fry. Uh, and, and they're not democracies. They are um, dictatorships. Um, anyway, I was, uh, I, I do shopping at Walmart. I, a lot of liberals don't approve of that because Walmart's such an evil corporation, but I did, was, I've been doing it to save money. <laughs> and, and, um, right, now, or at least that's what I thought. Now, what happened is, what happened is that um, uh, I, went to, I went to buy a box of oatmeal at Walmart. And uh, now, the oatmeal cost about, I believe, $1.68. And uh, I only had $20 bills on me, so I gave him a 20. And, uh, and the cashier, who's, I don't know, she seemed so out of it, she seemed like she was on Quaaludes or something. Anyway, she gave me, she gave me only, uh, so she should have given me $18 and change back. Well, she gave me $8, she skipped a 10. I didn't notice the error until I had left the cash register and, and, and then I sat down to count the money that she put in my hand. And, and then I realized it was eight rather than eighteen dollars. So I went back to the cashier. This was last night. This happened. I went back to the cashier and I said, "Hey, you only gave me eight dollars instead of eighteen. This is happy before at other stores, but things are operate a little different at Walmart." Uh, she uh, turned on a, a light to, so that the, the light on her above her cash register flashes so that she can call the so that she can call the um, call a ma call a manager. Well, no manager showed up. I guess they all had other priorities. So I got fed up with waiting, and I went and, and tracked down another cashier. I couldn't find any managers in sight. And uh, another manager actually did get, go get a, a, well, the other cashier actually went and got a manager. And I explained the problem to the manager, and, that, and I was figured, oh, I'm sorry. Well, I figured they'd say, oh, I'm sorry. We'll, we'll get you your money back. And nope, doesn't work that way. You know, not at Walmart. They, uh, they figure I'm probably a con man, you know, and so they, they decide they want to save, they want to hold on to every penny. So, so instead, they said, "Well, we'll have uh, we'll have security look at the video cameras and see if you're telling the truth, and uh, and then if we are, you can give us your name and phone number. And if it turns out that you are telling the truth, then we'll call you in the morning." Well, I was I was pretty pissed off about this, but there wasn't very much I could do, and so I did give him so I gave him one of my business cards and he left, and, uh, and then I never heard back from him today. So I went up there to. So I, I, I had this receipt still with me though, and, and, and lucky for me, lucky for me, the receipt lists the exact time. I already had written down. I'd taken notes from the evening, so I had all the information. 
and uh, it lists the exact time of the transaction, and it also lists the manager, the big boss, the, you know, the head guy. And um, so I called him, I decided to find out if this person was in, and also the uncooperative woman was there too. So I called, and I also had the phone number of the Walmart, so I called Walmart on the phone, um, and I asked him, and I asked him, um, the manager's name is Alfredo, and I asked, is Alfredo there? He said, oh, cool. Uh, Al Alfredo, who? I'm going to say Alfredo Rivera, the, the, the manager of the Walmart. And I said, um, and they said, um, well, when he goes, no, he's not here today. And I said, well, uh, who's the manager on duty? And they said, well, um, and, and, and they told me who it was. And, and I said, well, can I talk to her? And they said, are you an associate or, an or a, a customer? I'm a customer. Okay, hold on. So I, then I hung up the phone while, while, they, while I was on hold. And because uh, I didn't really expect to get anything from the phone call. I just did that so I could find out who was there so that I could ask for him by name. So then I drove up to the Walmart and, um, and I find that there's an area where they deal with complaints like mine. And, and there was an enormous line uh, for it. There was a huge number of angry people in this line. And I was just one of many. And, and finally I get to the head of the line after waiting for uh, half an hour because these angry people tended to, like me, they tended to not go away. And finally, I get, I get to the head of the line, and, uh, and, and, and by the way, I noticed that they always had the, clerk, the clerks would always tell them, can, can you give me, give, just give me a half minute? The There's nobody else. Let me finish the story real quick. Okay, so, so when I finally got to the head of the line, I explained my situation, and amazingly, she, the, the woman who I'd never seen before recognized me, and she said, oh, it's you. And uh, I don't know how she knew who I was, but but she said uh, just a minute. And so then she had to. She told me to wait. She said they got to. They, they, and she told me the same song and dance as the lady last night. I said, wait a second. How long is it going to take to check the cameras? And she said, well, five minutes. Okay, I'll wait. So I said what I didn't do last night. So I waited. Well, it didn't take five minutes. It took half an hour. And finally, finally, I, this is a now. I, I got my money back. And, and then I came here. That's why I was late. Uh, so I, but I just want to conclude by saying, don't shop at Walmart, because they're a bunch of fucking assholes. Oh, yeah, yeah. Ron, did you make the announcement by next week? Yes. You gave um, let's uh, let's welcome back uh, Ping for the final word tonight. Let's welcome back Lee Ping for the final word tonight. Some people think uh, I'm giving a uh, uh, uplifting talk. Uh, yeah, yeah, motivation talk. But uh, that's not my intention. My my intention just uh, try to say the truth. I was trained in, as a military uh, in Taiwan, so I'm uh, by nature I'm not against war. Okay, uh, I used to think war is necessary. Well, if you want peace, you have to overcome your opponent and get peace. But uh, of course, that's not the thinking right now. Another is uh, maybe I'm, uh, of course, uh, look at the bright side. Uh, there are lots of uh, hurdles, uh, obstacles towards the world peace. Just like I said, there are some cultural remnants uh, and uh, other. I think mostly are uh, or the people's greed or evil part that, that all comes up uh, as uh, problems uh, on the on the road to peace. I'm not uh, purely say this would be a smooth uh, way to go. And uh, in terms of America, I know lots of people think that. Right now, the, the democracy seems to uh, have some problems. Uh, people are fed up all the partisan, all the fighting between them without, without really give a solution to the country. And uh, lots of things controlled by the rich people, corporations, and the special interest group. Uh, but I think at least right now, we have two to uh, 
two boys are our concern. If you, we, if we make enough voice and the reasonable voice in a persuasive way to our point, to pinpoint what are what are the wrong things in this country, and uh, then we have uh, we can move in the right direction. Of course, we right now we have a big problem because uh, we have uh, lots of national federal debts and uh, uh, trade deficits. Uh, those uh, will, will bite us sooner or later, and uh, I don't think those uh, those will go away uh, without harm. So some times I found I also found this country is. Uh, is very ignorant, just uh, doing our way because we are the richest country in the world, we are the most powerful country in the world, so we don't really care other people, how the other people, how the, how the other country run. Like uh, we now have the only system, uh, English system for the weight and the length, and we are still using Nobody else is using around the world, not even English, in England. I think that will change uh, when our country becomes normal, okay? Well, becomes normal that uh, some other country will be big enough uh, or strong enough so attract our attention to look at, hmm, what's wrong with our country? Because we have been successful so long. We didn't learn anything from other countries. And uh, I think that's one dangerous for, for this country. Uh, uh, we should, uh, people can learn, and the human beings can only learn from experience, from mistakes. They, we never invent some, oh, this will be definitely successful road, and that's, that's very rare, I think, if it uh, even exists. So we need a learning experience. I see <coughs> Iraq war, Afghanistan war, Af Afghanistan war, our learning experience for this country. Our country can win the military to military war, but not the military to people war. And the military is uh, really useless to try to control, persuade other people. And uh, if we learn that, I hope uh, we have a good uh, future work out things with Israel, Iran, and uh, other country. Otherwise, we probably need to learn other bad experience uh, to go for Iran and get uh, a mess there, and then uh, hopefully, eventually, I think uh, we will. Uh, so that's uh, that's what I thought. It's it's not all bright future, uplifting, or uh, but there are lots of work for us to do. Thank you.